Hi, Broadway Church family, and happy Mother's Day. My name is Naomi, and it's a joy to be welcoming you to another online service today. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome here. If you'd like to connect with us, you can head over to our website, broadwaychurchlife.com. We'd love to hear from you. It's the time of year when everything in nature is changing, and I find myself reminded of God's promise of new life and new hope, which we can find in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. As we head into a time of worship this morning, I want to encourage you to allow this promise to soak into your heart and renew a spirit of hope within you. Say 
live at the corner of Broadway and Maple, bringing you tonight's top story. We have become aware that there have been multiple reports from concerned citizens in this corner of our city that have confirmed some suspicious activity that happened this past weekend involving dozens of people. Activities that included colorful streamers, jars of candy, hula hoops, bright clothing, loud and somewhat unrecognizable music, and even the exchange of money. There's even one report of a child dressed as a taco, smiling freely as her mom drove through the area. Apparently, this was all in response to an event that has been dubbed a drive through fiesta. And as it turns out, the concerned citizens were really not that concerned at all, since it was a fundraising event for a house building project that will take place almost 9,000 kilometers away, two countries over in a well-known place Broadway's people call the San Catin Valley. It was previously reported by this news team that the goal was to raise $8,000 for house building supplies by hosting an event like the one I just described, where people could purchase building materials that would be used to build a home for Broadway's adopted family later this summer. Fabiola and Artimio and their two children are the family Broadway has adopted, and they had hoped to raise the full amount of $8,000 for their house to be built. We now have a grand total to report to you, the viewers. To share that news, I brought in our Mexico correspondent and all-around helpful kid, Graydon Techmeyer, to share with you, the public, the actual dollar amount that was raised. Over to you, Grady. Thanks, Brad. And the total is 12,600. Back to you, Brad. Eola, Broadway. That is one big pile of pesos. What a blessing this is going to be to that family. I am told that the missions committee wants to express their heartfelt gratitude for the typical generosity that was displayed by so many people. Well, I guess that about does it. So this is This Ombre signing off on location near the corner of Broadway and Maple. Hey Broadway, it's so good to be here today. Not only do we get to come together virtually to worship God, but we also get to praise and thank Him for some of the special people in our lives. You already know who I'm talking about. That would be our mothers. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. It's way too easy to take the blessing of our mothers for granted. We don't always do a good job at encouraging and verbalizing the blessing that our mothers are to us. So today, if you have a mom, a grandmother, and or someone else who has taken a motherly role over you, I hope you can take a moment to make them feel special, loved, and appreciated. Put some words on it. Encourage them. Put some actions behind it. Do something with or for them. 
I have benefited greatly from my mom, as well as a legacy and community of mothers. Encourager, defender, supporter, possessor of wisdom, listener, advisor, sacrificial. These are just some of the attributes that I have associated with this role. That is not to say they are the only ones. No doubt you have other descriptors of mom. The bond with our mothers can be quite unique. We see this play out with Jesus and his mother Mary. We see it in our own lives. Personally, I see this dynamic at the hospital in my working life. How often does a kid come into the hospital with mom because he or she fell off the playground? All the time. Another scenario, not a rare case at all, but imagine someone has gone to the hospital because mom told me I should get this checked out. Don't we need our mothers? I also see the other end of the spectrum, when children have the opportunity to support and lift up their mom in a time of vulnerability. It's a pretty beautiful dynamic. So as we come together today, I want to invite you to join me as we take some time to pray. Please pray along with me. Thank you, God, for another day where we have the privilege to come to you as the body of Christ. Please give us a renewed perspective of the collective body of Christ today, even though we meet virtually while in our homes. Thank you for the moments of togetherness. We pray that you would help us grow in our ability to see opportunities for sacrifice and opportunities to help others. Please give us insights and creative ideas as to how we can do this. We ask you to speak to us today. We ask that we would be receptive of what you want us to learn. Give us a humility to approach this moment as an opportunity for growth and discovery. We pray that you would remove our hindrances, insecurities, and anything that is weighing us down today so that we can be focused on you. And Father, thank you for our mothers. Thank you for mothers that exemplify Christ-like attributes. Thank you for laughs with them. Thank you for conversations with them. Thank you for their encouragement. Thank you for their wisdom and advice. Thank you for the moments when they lift us up when we're hurting. Thank you for many more ways that our moms bless us and others. We want to celebrate them today and recognize that they are a gift from you. Lord, we also bring to you our collective and individual fears, worries, and hurts. Again, we come to you as the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters, and we recognize that some of us are suffering in various ways. Please meet us in our suffering and give us strength and perseverance. Please remind us that you are with us even when the future is unclear or when the present is scary. We trust you to meet us in these moments too, and we want to choose to hold tight to you. We ask you to be a tangible presence today and in the upcoming days. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Mother's Day. I want to share a cartoon with you this Mother's Day. It's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon, and we have quite a few fans at Broadway of Calvin and Hobbes, especially a cute little five-year-old boy. He would like to hear more Calvin and Hobbes cartoons in the sermons, so this one's for you, my friend. Calvin and Hobbes, the greatest cartoon strip of all time, or the far side. Both are equally funny, and bring the realities of human life to the forefront for us. Anyways, Calvin is a mischievous, adventurous six-year-old boy, and Hobbes is, is his down-to-earth and sometimes cynical anthropomorphic stuffed tiger. These cartoons cover spiritual topics and family topics and meaning of life, purpose of life ideas. Calvin is not necessarily someone to learn from, but many times he shows the human conditions of selfishness and pride and insecurity and fear. So here's Calvin and Hobbes Mother's Day cartoon. Hey mom, Calvin shouts, wake up. I made you a Mother's Day card. How sweet of you, Calvin. I did it by myself. Go ahead and read it. I was going to buy you a card with hearts of pink and red, but then I thought I'd rather spend the money on me instead. It's awfully hard to buy things when one's allowance is so small, so I guess you're pretty lucky I got you anything at all. Happy Mother's Day to you. There, I said it. Now I'm done. So how about getting out of bed and cooking breakfast? 
for your son. Way to go, Calvin. I am deeply moved, replied Calvin's mother. Calvin says, did you notice the part about the allowance? I hope you're able to bless your mom today. And if she's no longer with us, then I hope your memories of her love and grace will be with you in a special way today. So here we are, May 9th. If you want to go to your Bible, we're looking at Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. I'm going to read it all at once here, and then we will cover it in five points as we go through the sermon. Your Bible, I have the NIV here, calls this section, Jesus Anointed by a Sinful Woman. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but... Um, I'm calling the sermon Jesus and the city woman, just a little bit different. So verse 36, chapter 7. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this? who even forgives sins. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Many of the encounters with Jesus in the Gospels are with women. And along with that, many times are the Pharisees. Jesus gives us deep theological truths in these encounters as he speaks to the Pharisees about their attitudes toward women and to non-Jews in general. Today is another one of those occasions where the Pharisees single out a woman for her sin and Jesus turns the tables on them and points them to their own hypocrisy and sin. You know, one of the big complaints of the Pharisees about Jesus was who he ate with. Here's from Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them, has meals with them. Matthew 21, verse 31. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John, the Baptist, came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. The tax collectors and the prostitutes repented and believed. Matthew 9, 1. The Pharisees said to the disciples of Jesus, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
He is at the hospital where people know they need help. The Pharisees did not think they were sick with the sin virus. The tax collectors and sinners knew they needed grace and mercy and forgiveness. So Jesus is eating with them, sharing a meal. To the Pharisees, this was much worse than hanging out at the park, maybe just talking to them in big groups. He goes into houses, he shares a meal. What's the big deal? Well, in this religious culture, sharing a meal, eating together, eating together, had written and unwritten rules. So some background on the culture here. And here's some helpful books uh, that I used for this sermon. One is by Kenneth Bailey called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, Cultural Studies in the Gospels. And the other one is a great thick, great thick book I have called The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. Ancient Near East Eating Habits. They had two meals a day, a light midday lunch, and a big meal after work in the evening. Breakfast was a light snack, not considered a meal. A meal was never a time to simply ingest food as quick as you could and quench your thirst. It was a special time. Every meal was a time to display love and friendship. And the more formal the meal, the more loaded it is with messages. There's honor, social rank, purity, holiness, social status, and roles were acted out at various meals. And then when it was a Jewish meal, it had tremendous religious connotations. Every meal was a time to experience and enjoy God's presence and provision. The meal became the place where the Jews drew the line between outsiders and insiders in their families, in their communities, and ethnic groups. Non-Jews and strangers were excluded or had to undergo special ritual cleansing in order to participate in meals, let alone the ceremonial meals, any meals. There was concern for holiness, which grew rise to the kosher laws, and they reflected Jewish conviction that God is present at meals. We're in his presence. So to eat defiled food or to eat with unclean people is inappropriate and dishonoring to God. Imagine today having someone over and asking them to go upstairs and take a bath to be spiritually cleansed. And this would then make them holy to sit down with you for a meal. This is what's happening here. Jesus ate with sinners. He didn't have these ritual cleansings with them. He did not seem to care at all about their cleansing rituals before meals or ceremonies. In Judaism, table fellowship means fellowship with God. The meal was sacred and always held in the presence of God. And so they had all these rituals of cleansing. We would say it's true that God is in our presence at all of our meals. But every moment... Everywhere, everything God is present when we eat, when we work, when we play, when we go on holidays. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do as it to the Lord. The Lord cares about everything, every aspect of our lives. We don't have these ceremonies to make things clean or unclean. When Jesus gave thanks before breaking bread, he performs and transforms the blessing that was an integral part of every meal. It was a meal to be enjoyed with no time limits, no rush to watch your favorite show on TV or to eat in front of the TV watching hockey or football or baseball. You know, our lifestyle and family expectations are so different today than back then. But we can still learn the importance of an unrushed meal to simply enjoy the people around your table. That's what a meal is for here in the Bible. Today, we have incongruent work schedules between spouses. We have even activities to go to for kids and adults, sports, music, meetings. It's difficult to have this peaceful, timeless meal. Once a week, let's try for it, an evening meal or a possible weekend lunch. So the meal is about fellowship, and that's why the Pharisees are upset. This guy eats with the wrong people. You know, we love going out it's a, to a restaurant. No preparation, no cleaning, hopefully no time limit, a time to converse and laugh, have deep conversations or interesting topics, and enjoy each other. This is the meal, just like the keg commercial on TV. You know, the evening meal in the Jewish culture was the ultimate in fellowship, even with all its rules and ceremonies. That's why it was a big deal to how Pharisees look at what, who Jesus ate with. Some additional things to know about the culture and some definitions. A sinner, it just apply, implies that she is a prostitute. That's the idea here. Different translations say different things in these verses. Some say a woman from the city, a sinner. Other translations say a woman of the city who was a sinner. Eugene Peterson cuts to the chase and says the town harlot. 
a sex worker. Other translations say a certain immoral woman. Perfume was a tool of the trade in prostitution. And this would have been very offensive for Jesus to accept this perfume. Another part here is any woman with her hair exposed to public view would be considered promiscuous. And a teacher prophet would have been invited for dinner. These meals were open to the public to come in and watch this meal and the conversation. A prostitute would not have been welcome. So it took courage for her to attend. And so the guests reclined on their left elbow with their heads toward the table and their body stretched out away from it. So this woman would have had easy access to the feet of Jesus in behind. So here's point one, the impact of love and acceptance, we read. Her plan was to anoint his feet with perfume, but her emotions got the better of her and her tears began to fall on his feet. That's a lot of tears. She wiped them with her hair. Clearly, she was oblivious to the public opinion as she was in the grief of deep emotion. We're not clear if this was the first time she had met Jesus or she had heard him speak, and that's why she followed him in to the, to the dinner. We don't know. Conviction and change had happened at a previous time. The closer she gets to Jesus, the more she, she realizes he's holy. He's without sin. He's clean. I'm unclean in the sight of God. And so she begins to weep bitterly. Martin Luther rightly calls these tears heart water. These tears come out of her heart. This is a cleansing for her soul. This is an act of repentance. This is her publicly acknowledging before the most judgmental, shaming, condemning, self-righteous religious men in the world. Yes, I am a sinful woman and I have deep regret for the life I have lived but it's not like this anymore. Her eyes are filled with so many tears. They're coming down her cheeks. There's a quiver in her voice. There's so much water flowing out of her eyes that it wets Jesus' feet sufficiently to clean them. That's a broken, humble, repentant, devastated, grieved sinner. This is an act of repentance. Jesus is truly the doctor in the spiritual hospital. This is an act of worship. She falls at his feet. She is worshiping passionately, humbly, publicly, and generously. She's giving her best and giving her all in an act of repentance and just letting it happen there at the feet of Jesus. Number two, the impact of love and acceptance. Verse 39, the Pharisees think Jesus can't be a prophet. He has no prophetic insight. He should know who's touching him. Number two, he should know that godly do not associate with the wicked, with sinners. He can't be godly. A prophet is set apart for divine service. This is shameless behavior on the part of Jesus. Again, they're thinking he can't be the Messiah that they interpret from the Old Testament. A godly king would not allow this. Again, Jesus doesn't meet their expectations of a Messiah. Point number three. Jesus explains what's going on with these tears and the perfume and the cleaning with the story of two debtors, verses 40 to 43. A denarii was a coin worth a day's wage. 500 denarii versus 50 denarii debts. A denarii uh, was a day's wage. It's say 20 bucks an hour times eight hours times 500. That's an $80,000 debt compared to an $8,000 debt. One debt is 10 times greater than the other. That's the point, a massive difference. So let's ask an interesting question. Every month we get a balance statement. Uh, it tells us what our debts are, credit card debt, maybe housing debt, school loans, car payment debt, whatever. And sometimes you read that and go, man, I'm in the hole. I got debt. Let's think of it this way. What do we owe God? What if God sent us an individual sin ledger each month, <laughs> a debt statement, a monthly sin budget statement? Sin in, good works out, somehow us, we think we can write it up. Well, there's these good things and these bad things. What if God took an account of all our sin, past, present, future, all of our thoughts, words, deeds, sins of commission and sins of omission? What if God sent us a, a bill every month, a debt bill? What would you owe God? What would I owe God? What would your debt be? That's Jesus' point. Some of us would say, well, okay, from this day forward, I'm going to live a good life and hopefully not have a sin deficit. I'm going to live a perfect life. Finance experts have come up with what's called a debt-to-income ratio. 
And it's the percentage of income that pays off debt. And financial experts say that 36% is a good percentage. You know, we cannot pay off the debt no matter what percentage. There is no sin to good works ratio. We will always owe more than we can repay. The gospel teaches this, that we have a debt we cannot pay. Maybe a few years ago, you sang this song. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash away my sins. Amazing grace. Jesus Christ paid a debt I could never pay. That's the point of this story. This is what was happening at this dinner table with the Pharisees. What Jesus says is, God has come to forgive debt. That's what Jesus prays, remember? Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts, God. And Jesus is the means by which our debts are paid. Jesus is going to the cross to pay our debt. He's going to substitute himself and die in our place for our sins. And see, what religion tells us is how to pay our debt to God. They actually think we can do something about our debt. It's, we, can, we can earn forgiveness. No, by grace we are saved. It is not a result of anything we do. We don't pay our debt to God. Jesus is our spiritual banker, and he pays our debt. Jesus pays our debt. Jesus says, Simon, you may think your debts are small and her debts are large. You think you're not a capital S sinner. You're a little S sinner. I just have a little debt to God. But in dying in our place for our sins, Jesus proves that every one of us is in debt. For those of us who come to Jesus, our debt is canceled. That's what Jesus is saying here. It is finished, he said on the cross. The debt is paid in full. There's nothing left to do to have forgiveness in the sight of God. This is what this woman is experiencing. And number four is Simon, learn from this woman. Verses 44 to 47. Jesus is going to defend her honor and give her dignity. Jesus looks at her and he talks to Simon. He looks at her smiling probably. He says, Simon, do you see this woman? No. Well, what Simon actually sees in his mind is a depraved wretch. This is not what Jesus sees. And see, this is the question. Simon, do you even see her? Because you look at people through your merit-based religious eyes. You don't actually see the people. All you see, Simon, is someone who is condemnable, damnable, shamed, just shamed. You don't see anyone made in the image of God and likeness of God. You don't see anyone who needs the love and grace of God. You just see a wretch. You don't see someone whose debt can be canceled, whose life can be transformed. This is what's happening at this dinner. You see, Jesus sees her in a way that Simon doesn't because Jesus looks at her through the lens of love and Simon looks at her through the reality of a sin ledger. Jesus says, Simon, do you not even see her? Because Simon is thinking in his heart, she's evil. She's a notorious sinner. Jesus is saying, obviously, she knows that. Look at her. She doesn't need another lecture on sin. She's devastated. The Holy Spirit has broken her resistance. She can't stop crying. She's come to me. She needs help. She needs a Savior. Simon, do you not see this? This woman needs a Savior. Simon, do you not know who I am? Do you not know why I'm here? Do you, do you not realize that she's a great example for you? Learn from her. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Simon, you gave me no kiss. This was a formal greeting. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. Simon, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with expensive perfume. You can't crusade for righteousness without compassion for the person. You got to remember, we're all coming from the same place. Our gratitude to God should translate into offering the compassion to others that God has given us. Jesus says, Simon, She's a worshiper. You're not. She repents. You don't. She serves. You won't. Learn from her. She gives generously. You don't give at all. 
Simon, this woman can teach you some things about being humble, repentant, broken, honest, generous, serving, caring, being considerate and loving and thankful. Can you imagine this? This woman teaching Simon. You know, what was her background? In grade eight career planning, did she give her presentation said, I want to be a prostitute? No, I doubt it. Did she have a dad? Did her dad leave her, throwing her and her mother into poverty, forcing her into prostitution to pay the bills? We don't know. Did her husband cheat on her, leave her for another woman, abandon her, betray her? We don't know. The Bible tells us everything we need to know. It doesn't tell us everything we might want to know. Jesus does not excuse her sin or neglect her sin or shift the blame for her sin. He says, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Oh, the grace of Jesus. Her sins are forgiven. She loves much. Our love for Jesus may not be great because we have not appreciated the depth of forgiveness we have received. We need to worship. When you know how much Jesus loves you and you love him back, that's the beginning of your worshipful, generous relationship. That's where everything changes. And the last point, people. Me, you, we need to learn as well from the story, verses 48 to 50. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisee people here said, what? Only God forgives sins. Jesus forgives sins? You know, priests at the time could pronounce God's forgiveness after a sin offering. Jesus declares forgiveness of sins without this sacrifice at the temple. Jesus says, you're forgiven here, now. No need to go anywhere. It's finished, paid in full. Go. Go in peace. Jesus is not saying that the woman's actions here have earned forgiveness, or even that her love has merited forgiveness. Her love is proof that she already has been forgiven. Her tears were her response to God's grace. Your faith has saved you. The love and gratitude is a consequence of salvation, not a cause of salvation. You are saved from your sins. You are saved. You are kept by God as well. You are stored by God in His hand. You're not deleted. You are in the hard drive of God and will not get lost or put in the trash. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Sins forgiven, and saved and kept by Him. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to us by which we must be saved. It's the Jesus of this story. And then, of course, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you and I have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. We have a debt ledger, a sin debt ledger. It's a gift of God. He wipes it clean not by our works, but by the work of Jesus on the cross. So some things to think about today. When the Pharisees look at someone, what is their default position? In the sermon, I used the term depraved wretch purposely. It has become a standard term in some Christian circles to describe human beings. And that's, I I believe, how the Pharisees saw this woman. There's a clothing company in the States called Depraved Wretch, and they state that their purpose for existence is to expose human nature and extol God's mercy. They say, we create reformed apparel and produce free materials to saturate the internet with the gospel. This is misaligned, I believe. Yes, the Bible describes humanity as lost in their sins and sinful and in need of forgiveness. But to take as your position that the first thing to know about yourself and others is that you are a depraved wretch, that is to think like a Pharisee. I think it's wrong. Yes, we cannot save ourselves, but Jesus looked at people and had compassion. He saw people as sheep without a shepherd. We need to think and act like Jesus. If Jesus was to wear a gospel t-shirt, I think it would say this. It would not say, you are a depraved wretch. It would have an arrow on it pointing to his heart and his face. And this t-shirt would say, you are weary and burdened. Come to me. I will give you water for your thirsty soul. I will forgive your sins and give you grace and mercy. And on the back, it would read, 
You are made in the image of God. In me, you can be a new creation. The old has gone and the new has arrived. When Jesus looks at someone, what is his default position? When we look at someone, what is our default position? We need to merge our view, our perspective with that of Jesus. Think about this as you encounter people this week and talk with people. And finally, to think about this. What can we learn from this two debtors story and from this forgiven woman? Think about worship, service, gratitude, generosity. People, the work on the cross has been done. We can go in peace in our soul, just like this woman. The peace of canceled debt. Our sin debt has been dealt with. Jesus has paid it in full. And we can look to the future with hope, with certainty, as we await the time when Jesus returns and we see him face to face. We will sit at his feet with tears and worship him.
Thanks for joining us this morning. I hope you are able to begin your week feeling refreshed and renewed from spending time in worship and hearing the word. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you again next week.